Hi everybody, it's John Weecroft here bringing you another Sunday Q&A. This week we're up to the landmark week number 50 and this is the last week that's going to feature any unique content. Uh, the last two weeks, 51 52, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. So I want to thank you for getting this far in this series. Uh, I hope that you've managed to get something from uh, these video lessons. I've certainly learned a lot in doing them. It's been really, really good for me in terms of keeping my playing focused and motivated and uh, kept me practicing throughout lockdown. Now, as it is, things are beginning to start to get busy again, uh, fortunately, so gigs are happening. And I'm um, eight tracks into a 12-track album, which has needed to take a back seat in uh, recent months just due to being so busy with other stuff, which now needs to take priority. So I hope you wish me well. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for all the great questions and the support and all the messages that I've had along the way. Uh, this week is no different. I've had some great questions. So I'm going to be looking at some ways of making the transition between chord melody ideas or more kind of harmonic ideas and single note lines. I'm going to show you some ways to think about uh, combining the two, going in both directions. So going from a single note melody to something that's more chord orientated and then also breaking out from something that's more chord orientated into single note lines, so switching between the two. Uh, I'm also gonna be looking at some ways to create an intro to a tune. Three options, very simple, just three things that you can do in a very, very short space of time, like at a jam session, or if uh, someone asks you to set a tune up so you know what you could do, what, what some of your options are, and uh, by, uh, by no means is this gonna be exhaustive, it's just something that's gonna be uh, hopefully helpful. If you need to do that, very quickly, like in the moment, like improvise an intro to a song. So we're going to look at that. We're also going to be looking at some five altered to one minor lines. And we do this in the same key as the piece that we're going to play today. So the piece I'm playing today is uh, the famous Night in Tunisia. But I'm going to be doing it slightly differently in that I've rearranged it into 5-4. So it's in a 5-4 time signature. I first heard that uh, played in 5-4 by the amazing Sylvan Luke. And it definitely works. I'd urge you to check him out if you've not checked him out already. He's absolutely wonderful. He's a totally amazing guitar player. So, as always, I hope you enjoy the music and I'll see you on the other side for the questions. <laughs>
really great question this week from Henry asking about uh, some tips for creating intros, particularly when you're on the spot. So like at a jam session when someone looks at the guitar player and says, set this tune up, what kind of things might you do? Now, of course, arranging an intro uh, when you have all the time in the world, then you have a limitless amount of options. But what we're talking about here is the kind of thing that you might want to come up with in the moment when you're playing a tune, a tune's just being called on the bandstand and somebody needs to take control to, uh, to set things off rather than just dropping straight in uh, at bar one for the melody. So I'm gonna give you three options here, three different things that you can use. Of course, there's way more than three, but these three might be able to uh, uh, just give you somewhere to begin and might get you out of trouble if you find yourself in that situation. Okay, so let's imagine that we're in a medium swing kind of situation in the key of C. Okay, so a tune, like kind of like All of Me, one of those kind of songs, like where uh, we know we're gonna start on the one chord. So we need to be, that's the first consideration is you need to figure out where we start in the harmony. Not every piece starts on the one chord. Some tunes start on the four, some tunes start on the two things like that. And that's gonna uh, have an influence as to how we might set a particular piece up. Right? What chord might we need to create tension? Now, obviously for C major, the chord that we're gonna use to create that cliffhanger tension before we come into the piece is the five chord of G7. So essentially, we wanna get to G7. So you'll find that a lot of these uh, turnaround ideas are going to uh, lean quite heavily on the five chord G7. But let's begin with the first idea that we can use for an intro, and that's a simple turnaround. So that's something that you might just say to the band, you know, let's do a turnaround to start. You might even uh, consider finishing the piece on a turnaround as well. So turnaround would generally be a one, six, two, five. land on the five chord and then we're in with the tune. Now of course this could go round forever. And then we're in with our piece. Now there's lots of different variations here for the turnaround. You may have noticed there the first time I played one, six is a dominant seven, now I have a choice here. This D could be a D minor, or it could be a D7, a G7 as well. Or we could do tritone substitutions. We made the major sevens even. Lady bear turn around, so on. So I would suggest that you uh, that you stock up on your turnaround ideas. Very often at the end of that, we're gonna have some kind of like, uh, like a little setup there to go to the five chord. So even though we're going one, six, two, five, maybe three, six, two, five, one, six, two, five, one, and then we're in with our tune. So you can clearly hear, I would hope that uh, the band and the audience are gonna know when we go, that then we're next, next expecting. The piece is gonna come in. Now, of course, this could be major or minor, um, but in this instance, we're dealing with major. There's a brilliant video by Joe Pass, which I suggest you check out, called Solo Jazz Guitar and uh, for the first half of that video, if I remember rightly, it's one of those uh, Hot Licks, um, Arlen Roth's company called Hot Licks. And you can buy it, I think I bought it recently, just, just for old time's sake, because I was writing something about Joe Pass in a guitar magazine, and I thought, I really should own that again. Uh, I've got it on VHS video, but I haven't actually got a video player. So uh, I think it was about 15 pounds for this DVD, Joe Pass solo jazz guitar. And uh, it was a real trip down memory lane because I just devoured that video when I was in my late teens. And uh, it was interesting to watch it again some 30 years later 
uh, to realize that almost everything that he said in that video, all the chord voicings had really sunk in and they were like the chord voicings that I use a lot of the time. Certainly a, a huge portion of them, a huge percentage of them are still in my plane. And anyway, what he does for the first half is he takes a one, six, which you'd expect to be minor, two, which you'd expect to be minor, five, which is a dominant, and he uh, utilizes a whole bunch of chord substitutions. So the six can become a dominant because it's the five of the two, and the two can become a dominant because it's the five of the five. And then they can have altered tendencies like raise fives, the raise nine, sharp five, or, or whatever you wanted to have, you know, can have, um, uh, you could play a tritone substitute of each of those chords. You could go C, and instead of going to the A, you go to an E flat. Maybe we stay on the D, and then we go to a D flat. Those kind of ideas. substitute an E minor for the C. It's basically the same chord, so now that gives us a three, six, two, five, one. Or we can cycle that round. And then we're in with our tune. So a turnaround could be thing number one. Of course, Practice these in minor as well. And it's a good idea to have some kind of turnaround couplets, if you like, some turnaround uh, chordal licks, if you like. Often we consider licks to be uh, single note things, you know, i.e. some pre-worked out, some uh, routines, if you like, that you might use uh, to draw from in the moment, particularly when something is thrown upon you with little preparation, it's good to have some things that are prepared. Improvisation is fantastic, but it's also good to have some things that you know you can rely upon. Every player's got them, you know, whether or not they know it, whether they do that kind of uh, consciously or subconsciously, they're all in there, you know. So with that in mind, a chord lick could be. Of course, I'm playing the bass line there. If I was playing with a bass player, I wouldn't do that. But still, a turnaround is definitely a viable introduction technique. The second of our options is what we might call the last eight or the last four or the last 12 of the sequence. Depends upon the structure of the piece that you're playing. So this is where it helps that you know the form accurately, that you know, for argument's sake, a tune like All The Things You Are has got an extra four bars on the end of the form that you wouldn't necessarily expect. So it doesn't divide up into fours and eights. Well, it certainly divides into fours, but it does so in an uneven way, which makes trading rather interesting. It's always something to uh, keep in mind when you get involved with uh, trading fours, so 36 bars in the form, then you need to know about that when you get to the end, if you're trading with two players, of course. Now, with this in mind, if we take a tune similar to uh, a tune like All Of Me, that's got a clear cadence at the end. So if I went for the last eight and went We're in. Really clear. Now you could actually play the melody. And then we're in, you know, it's clear that that would set the tune up. And then we're in, you know, it's really, if you do that, it does everything that the band needs to know to come in in the right place. Particularly, you've got to come in strong, you come in with the, the melody, say, or you could do an improvisation, you know. clear where we're coming in hopefully that's uh, that, that comes in clear because the band what they need to know they need to know what tempo are you intending to play the song at what kind of feel is it going to be and they'll get all of that from you going and then we're in you know uh, a 
again, it could just be the last four, and very often the last four is a turnaround. So with that in mind, they kind of tie in. So thing number one, the turnaround, and thing number two, the last section of the tune um, could be the same thing. Not always, though. So you need to be aware of that. This is where it's good to know, uh, well, it's essential that you know the melodies to these songs because what you probably wouldn't want to do is cut into a section kind of mid-phrase or mid-line. That might not make sense. That's where it might be more appropriate to maybe play the last 12 if you're playing a 36 bar form tune because the last section's got an eight bar melody with a four bar tag. So if you play the last eight, you're kind of clipping a melody in half, you know, depending upon the tune. Of course, the last four can work quite well as well. So I would suggest when you learn a new piece, this is something that you should be looking at. You could look at the form of the piece, look at the chart, say, and say to yourself, okay, if I were gonna create an intro for this, would it work? Is it gonna work for this particular piece? Some pieces it's not gonna work with probably. You know, you probably wouldn't wanna play the last eight of a 12 bar blues. That might sound a bit funny, you know. Uh, last four might work, uh, or maybe a turnaround might be better. Or maybe option number three, which we're about to look at in a moment. So just to recap, so far we've got option one, some form of a turnaround. Option number two, you could call it a tag if you like, the last 12, last eight, last four, whatever that might be. Of course, remember that that could also be something that you could use, usually last four, but many, many times the last two even, for like a three times tag or an infinity tag if you like, you know, on cue tag at the end of the piece. Because remember, once you set a piece up, it's gonna finish at some point. So it's not such a bad idea when you start if you've got some kind of a plan as to how it's gonna finish. Very often, if you get together on those thrown together gigs where you're meeting the band on the gig, the thing that you might do before you play, you know, if you get there in the sound check, you won't run all the tunes because the improvisation is the stuff that's gonna happen in the moment. But what you might do is uh, top and tail, as they say. You might figure out, okay, how are you gonna set this one up? and how you're gonna end it. It's particularly prevalent if you're playing one of those songs that just goes round and round and round. Like say you play a piece like Bluesette or Solar or one of those tunes. If you're not careful, when you get to the ending, if you've not got an ending worked out, you end up having to go around the progression one more time just by default, just because you've got nothing else to do and you could be there forever. So at some stage, somebody needs to take control and establish an ending. Now, a good uh, option is what we're gonna look at now in a moment. The option of either setting up what we might call a pedal or a vamp, and that's gonna be option number three. A vamp is a short progression, usually consisting of maybe only a couple of chords, certainly not a complex sequence that goes round and round in a loop. So, some examples of a vamp that you could choose. You could, if you wish, play from the one chord. So, if we take our, our feel for, that's what we wanna play. That's what we want to get to. Okay, so our vamp might go. Two, three, four, in. Okay, so something like that. So our vamp there, in this case I was playing the one chord. In this case it's C6. Then I went to the flat two. And that's in that case a D flat 13. It's actually a tritone substitute of a G7, and G7 is kind of the important part. And again, you could either, you know, have one guitar could be, or one instrument could be playing the chords. Or you could be improvising over that. Again, that could serve really beautifully as an outro. So let me give you a couple more. Okay, so the one to the flat two. It's quite nice because it's clear. It also gives you the option of landing on a five chord. Okay, you could go from the one to the flat seven. to flat seven. And then we're in, whatever. Okay, so very similar to 
Uh, but what you'll sometimes hear players on the bandstand call out, again, they'll just shout this out and they'll expect you to uh, to respond. They'll say pedal. So instead of it saying vamp, let's vamp on the one chord or vamp on, you know, very often in bossa nova you hear that. Latin tunes where you go between the one and the flat two. A pedal would be the five. Very often there's a sus. So we're pedaling on the five. And very often what you might find is it'll be like kind of unaltered five. Like the elevens and thirteens. And then when you want it to move, We'll incorporate some of those tensions, you know. Pushes it off the cliff. So now we know that we've got to start, the tune needs to start. So that's the difference between uh, what we might call a non-functioning dominance, you know. Like an 11, we could stay there all day. And if I play something maybe like, with a raised nine and a flat five, it's really got to move. At that point, you've pushed that dominant to its conclusion. We can combine attributes from the pedal and the vamp. So we could take something like a five chord sus, sidestep, and then we're in, we're clearly in. So play around with these things. I'd suggest when looking at new material or maybe revisiting old material, make sure that you spend the time to add an intro and an outro and try and explore all the different options. It's good uh, that you're aware of these things because you can respond when other musicians are doing it. When you play and someone else instigates an intro, you've got a kind of good idea of what they might be thinking of. And then also it means that you can take control. You know, if it's your music, it's your gig, then people are going to be expecting you to set the tunes up because then that way you're not going to be surprised by the tempo or the feel's not going to be uh, what you're not expecting or not what you desire. You know, you can dictate the feel of the tune by how you play the intro. And it also, as I said earlier, it also uh, has an influence on how you might get out of the tune. It might, you can echo what you do in the intro and the outro. There you have a ready-made arrangement, you know, improvised on the fly. So with this in mind, do as much playing as you can with other musicians. These are not the kind of things you're gonna to get together playing with backing tracks. So I would say, when uh, when it permits, get together and jam with as many players, preferably if they're a bit more experienced than you, and just pay attention, particularly at what I call the junction points in the music. The points where something's gonna change, that's when you need to be locking up. There's nothing more frustrating than you get to the end of a section, you wanna give a cue, you look around and the band are all looking in different directions, you know, or they miss it and you've got to go around again. So at that point, make certain that you're constantly keeping eye co contact with whoever's leading. Usually it's the soloist or whoever's maybe the singer or whoever's playing the melody. They're usually the ones that are going to give the cue, of course. I had a great question from Jordan asking if I had any tips for uh, breaking in and out of chord melody, going to single note lines, chord melody, single note lines, those kind of things. So that's a massive topic, but I'm gonna give you just three very simple little devices that you can use um, to, uh, to at least get you on your way, start you on your way. Okay, so the first of which I call chord breakouts. Okay, so we're gonna start with any chord really, but I'll choose this one. Like a kind of an E major with a sharp 11, flat five. Of course, I can do this with chord sequences as well, but for now, just for simplicity's sake, we're gonna just take a basic chord, so it's open, seven, eight, eight, nine, or root, sharp 11, major seven, major third, more useful. Okay, so my challenge to you is, can you take each of those notes that are in that chord, and see them as a kind of a, a like a stepping stone to melodic material. So let's take the B string. So the melodic idea is that's the major third. So I can 
and break out into those kind of melodies from that note. How about the notes on the, uh, the G string now? So this is major seven. Imagine going in and out from every note, so we can go from the sharp eleven, uh, sorry, from the major third, we can go from, in this case, the major seven, we can go from the sharp eleven, or from the root. Of course, this could be more involved, like yeah, as if it's more like a minor two five one in this case, more than one chord. So you could take a string, that kind of idea. see in that case I just took a particular string in mind but let's go back to the single chord to keep keep this simple so we could do this with any chord but for now we stick with this one so I'm asking myself what are the notes that are in orbit around these chord notes so where's the scale so that's the third there's the second there's the sharp 11 okay now the third string that's the seven seven root two three Six. Okay. That's the sharp eleven. And this is obviously the root. So in principle I could be vamping away. So that's thing number one, I call a chord breakout. Our second and third concepts are rather similar in, in that what we're talking about here is taking a melody on, uh, on the high strings and harmonizing each melody note with every possible um, supporting chord, or meaning that each melody note has got an option of certain supporting chords that we can use to harmonize. So that means at any point when we're playing melodies, we can drop back into chords or at any point where we're playing chords, we can flip back to melodies. So the first of which I'm going to do by using drop two voicings. So in this case, we'll do this in the key C. So we do C6. So that's C6 with the uh, the root in the bass and the third in the treble. There's with the sixth in the bass and the root in the treble. Here it is with the fifth um, in the treble, third in the bass. And then we just move along. Now, of course, C6 and A minor 7 are the same thing, so it can be uh, interchangeable. But I'm thinking of this as a C major. Okay, and all these voices. So the first thing to do is make certain that you're okay with these, that these voices are, are not uh, new to you or not unfamiliar to you. Okay, now what we can do, that's given us the root 3, 5, 6, root 3, 5, 6. It's not giving us all the scale tones. That comes with the chord that goes in between. That's the reason why I've chosen C6, is because I can have root, there's a gap, and then I can go third, there's a gap, fifth, there's a gap, albeit very small, but there's a gap nonetheless. Five, six, there's a gap. Whereas if I pick major seven, there's no gap between the seven and the root, so it doesn't allow me to put this um, a connecting chord in. Okay, so here we have C6. Our gap chord is G7 flat 9, as we know, diminished chord. We've looked at this a few times. C7 
C6 diminished, C6 diminished, C6 diminished, C6 diminished, C6 diminished, C6. So now we've got this potential to harmonize the melody. So every one of these melody notes can be harmonized now. So we have, if we go the root, the second, which will be um, there, the third, the fourth even, the fifth, the raised fifth, the sixth, the major seven, the tonic, the second, the third, the fourth again, and we land on the fifth. We get to raise fifth, sixth. We we'll go as far as there. I'm not going to get those high chords on this guitar. Okay, so that's thing number one. So do that with both major and minor. You've kind of got a clue there for minor. You could do it with minor six. Minor seven, you've already got. It's the same as what you've just done. A minor seven is C6. It's the same principle. Our third idea is similar to example two, but less formulaic. Meaning with uh, the drop two voice ins, we go from one voice into the next through a chord. They all move through the arpeggio in a dependable, reliable, consistent way. In this instance, I'm just going to choose different C chords, because this is going to be C major, that support, initially, the C major scale. So let me give you my choices. Okay, for the note C, I'm going to use the C major 7. So again, the point of this is that if I hear a melody, could drop back into that chord or I could use that chord as a way to break out of course I'm gonna in this instance the melody is always going to be the top note in reality it could be any of the notes in the chord of course but for this one so C as the treble note okay then I'm going to change that to a D and maybe pick a different voice in that note C major 9 perhaps or maybe C 6 9 whatever you prefer you know whichever one you can get to, really. For the E, you might choose C major 7. If you've got the time, you may be something a little bit more interesting. So now, if my melody was... Like harmonizing chords. Or break out, or break back in again. Okay, for the F, I'm going to choose an F over C. That's the only instance where the chord's going to change because it creates a suspension. Of course, you could if you play more of a Lydian sound. Make that into a raise four. But for now, I'm just going to stick with the major scale. So, one, two, three. Maybe I'll pick that one. Four. Five, I'll pick like a kind of six, nine. Whatever you've got. Six, seven, octave, uh, whichever, or maybe that. Sometimes I pick a different voice in based upon what I know I'm going to pick for the next one, you know. So if my melody was, so I know. I'm back into chords again, so I could be playing single note lines. Hope this is making sense. Okay, so let me run the scale again. C major with C on the top, C major 9, D on the top, C major 7 with E, or you know this kind of inside 9 chord, like that. F over C, choose whichever one you want, C6-9, C major with a 13, some kind of major 9. The root, the 9th, 
with the third, F full with C again, with the fourth, and then maybe me. So you can take other scales, like in this case his C altered, with the root, with the flat nine, with the raised nine, with the major third, with the flat five, with the sharp five, with the flat seven, with the tonic, with the flat nine, with the raised nine, with the major third. Flat five is going to be a tricky one. Am I going to be able to get in? I'll give it a go. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, tricky that one. It's getting a bit high on that guitar, but you get the idea. So this means now that if I've got a, a melody line that I can harmonize with each of those notes, I can break in and break out again. So it's definitely something to think about. Of course, in this instance, I've just looked at this with one solitary chord. Of course, naturally, we can then begin to expand upon these ideas and apply them to pairs of chords, two five ones, turnarounds, vamps even, and so on. We'll end today with a pair of snappy five to one altered to minor lines in D minor, similar to the tune that I played at the head. Although I'm gonna put it into four four, just for, uh, to keep things simple, keep this in four four. So these are short and snappy triadic ideas. Um, I'll play them for you, but the chords that they're gonna work against are A7, raise five, and D minor nine perhaps. One, two, three, four. First, it's kind of like Mike Stern type thing based upon a triad pair. So from A7 altered, it comes from B flat melodic minor. There's two major triads in that harmony, and they are E flat and F. So our lick is going to be based on E flat, F, E flat. Bouncing between those two triads, so like A7, E flat, F, E flat again. So it's in triplets. Three, four. That's our A7 alt. Okay, now the cool thing about these triad pairs. when you're in a minor tonality, there's, there's cool connections in major as well, but for minors, when I go to D minor, my triad pairs now become, well, like, so what? F and G. So whereas it was E flat and F, it now becomes F and G. So I can take that idea, the triadic idea, and keep it moving up a tone. First, first bit, yeah. So D minor. So that, that's F, G, maybe we'll slide down to resolve. That'll resolve to a nice uh, uh, resolute fifth degree rather than landing on a sixth, which is still cool, but just so that you can clearly hear it whilst there's no harmony behind. Number two is also a triadic idea, very similar to something that I played earlier. It's a lick I use quite a bit, a phrase that I, I rely upon, but I think I got it from Joe Diorio. Okay, so this is again, it's triplet. Okay, let's cut. Lick number two is a Joe Diorio idea, but I've borrowed it quite heavily. Uh, again, triplets, but a rest, it goes rest. Rest. 
So A altered is an E flat major triad but with a sharp 11. That kind of thing. minor pentatonic against D minor to give us the nine we're played in fourths Robin Fordy but make no mistake you know Robin got a lot of those ideas from Joe I believe rest there's one down up down 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 up so there's our two phrases. Et voila. So that brings us to a close for number 50. And this is the last uh, unique content for our Q&A. Next week, I'm going to do a bit of a best of. I've had some requests to repeat some of the things. Um, so what I'm going to do is make a compilation of, my, of uh, the best bits, the things that have been the most requested and seem to have gone down um, really well. And then in week 52, I'm going to make a compilation of all of the performances. It's going to be quite long, uh, but it's a significant amount of, uh, of tunes. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm looking forward to seeing just how many of them uh, or just how long it is. Uh, that's kind of like what I've created within the last year. But thanks to you for uh, following these uh, sessions i hope that you've got something from it i hope that you can continue to dip into them i'm going to leave them up on uh, facebook and youtube so they're going to be there for the uh, for the time being at least so let me know if uh, if you've enjoyed these sessions it's really really nice to hear from you please leave any comments uh, shares and likes are always gratefully received um, yeah reach out i'm pretty easy to get hold of via my website or via social media and whatnot so thanks once again. I hope you enjoyed this week. I hope you've enjoyed weeks 1 to 50. It's been a year. Take care of yourself and hopefully see you on a gig. Take it easy.